Turn in your Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32, and we'll start reading at verse 28. Deuteronomy, chapter 32, starting at verse 28. For they are a nation void of counsel, nor is there any understanding in them. Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. How could one chase a thousand, and two put ten thousand to flight, unless their rock had sold them, and the Lord had surrendered them? For their rock is not like our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is of the vine of Sodom, and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall, their clusters are bitter, their wine is the poison of serpents, and the cruel venom of cobras. Is this not laid up in store with me, sealed up among my treasures? Vengeance is mine, and recompense, their foot shall slip in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things to come hasten upon them. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. I wanted to uh, focus upon a phrase in verse 35, which says, Their foot shall slip in due time. Now in this verse is threatened the vengeance of God on the wicked, unbelieving Israelites, who were God's visible people and who lived under the means of grace, but who, notwithstanding all of God's wonderful works towards them, remain void of counsel, as we read in verse 28, having no understanding in them. Under all the cultivation of heaven, they brought forth bitter and poisonous fruit, as in the two verses preceding our text say. The expression I've chosen for my text, their foot shall slide in due time, seems to imply the following things, relating to the punishment and destruction to which these wicked Israelites were exposed. Number one, that they were always exposed to destruction, as one that stands or walks in slippery places is always exposed to fall. This is implied in the manner of their destruction coming upon them, being represented by their foot sliding. The same is expressed in Psalm 73 verse 18 where we read, Surely thou didst set them in slippery places and cast them down to destruction. Secondly, it implies that they were always exposed to sudden unexpected destruction as he that walks in slippery places is every moment liable to fall he cannot foresee one moment whether he shall stand or fall the next and when he does fall he falls at once without warning which is also expressed in psalm 73 verses 18 and 19 surely you did set them in slippery places, thou you cast them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment? Thirdly, another thing implied is that they are liable to fall of themselves without being thrown down by the hand of another, as he that stands or walks on slippery ground needs nothing but his own weight to throw him down. Fourthly, the reason why they are not fallen already and do not fall now is only that God's appointed time is not come. For it is said that when that due time or appointed time comes, their foot shall slide. Then they shall be left to fall as they are inclined by their own weight, God will not hold them up in these slippery places any longer, but will let them go. And then at that very instant, 
they shall fall into destruction. As he that stands on such slippery declining ground, on the edge of a pit, he cannot stand alone. When he is let go, he immediately falls and is lost. Now the observation from the words that I would now insist upon is this. There is nothing that keeps wicked men at any one moment out of hell but the mere pleasure of God. By the mere pleasure of God I mean his sovereign pleasure, his arbitrary will, restrained by no obligation, hindered by no manner of difficulty, any more than if nothing else but God's mere will had in the last degree or any in any respect whatsoever any hand in the preservation of wicked men one moment. The truth of this observation may appear by the following considerations. Firstly, there is no want or power in God. There is no want of power, no lack of power in God to cast wicked men into hell at any moment. Men's ha hands cannot be strong when God rises up. The strongest have no power to resist him, nor can any deliver out of his hands. He is not only able to cast wicked men into hell, but he can most easily do it. Hmm. Sometimes an earthly prince meets with a great deal of difficulty in subduing a rebel, a rebel who has found the means to fortify himself and has made himself strong by the number of his followers. But it's not so with God. There is no fortress that is any defence from the power of God. Though hand join in hand and a vast multitude of God's enemies combine and associate themselves, they are easily broken in pieces. They are as a great heaps of light chaff before the whirlwind, or large quantities of dry stubble before devouring flames. We find it easy to tread on and crush a worm that we find crawling on us. So it is easy for us to cut or singe a slender thread that anything hangs by. Thus easy it is for God, when he pleases, to cast his enemies into hell. What are we that we should think to stand before him at, who, at whose rebuke the earth trembles and before whom the rocks are thrown down? Secondly, they deserve to be cast into hell, so that divine justice never stands in the way. It makes no objection against God using his power at any moment to destroy them. No, on the contrary, justice calls aloud for an infinite punishment of their sins. Divine justice says of the tree that brings forth such grapes of Sodom, cut it down, cut it, cut it down. Why is it wasting itself in the ground? As we read in Luke chapter 13, verse 7. The sword of divine justice is every moment brandished over their heads, and it is nothing but the hand of arbitrary mercy and God's mere will that holds it back. Thirdly, they are already under a sentence of condemnation to hell. They do not only justly deserve to be cast down there, but the sentence of the law of God, that eternal and immutable rule of righteousness that God has fixed between him and mankind, is gone out against them and stands against them so that they are bound over already to hell. As we read in John chapter 3, verse 18, he that believes not is condemned already, so that every unconverted man properly belongs to hell. That is his place, from thence he is. As we read in John chapter 8, verse 23, 
you are from beneath, and there he is bound to go. It is the place that justice and God's word and the sentence of his unchangeable law assign to him. Fourthly, they are now the objects of the very same anger and wrath of God. God, no, no doubt, is a great deal more angry with great numbers that are now on the earth than with some who may be watching this video who couldn't care less, who are, are easy with, with the fact that they don't know Christ. So it is not because God is unmindful of their wickedness and does not resent it that he does not let loose his hand and cut them off. God is not altogether such a one as themselves, though they might imagine him to be so. The wrath of God burns against them. Their damnation does not slumber. The pit is prepared. The fire is made ready. The furnace is now hot, ready to receive them. The flames do now rage and glow. The glittering sword is wetted and held over them, and the pit has opened its mouth under them. Fifthly, the devil stands ready to fall upon them and seize them as his own. At what moment God shall permit him? They belong to him. He has their souls in his possession and under his dominion. The scriptures represent them as his goods. As we read in Luke chapter 11, verse 21, the devils watch them. They are ever by them at their right hand. They stand waiting for them like greedy hungry lions that see their prey and expect to have it but are for the present kept back if god should withdraw his hand by which they are restrained they would in one moment fly upon their poor souls the old serpent is 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 gasping for them hell opens its mouth wide to receive them and if God would permit it, they would be hastily swallowed up and lost. Sixthly, there are in the souls of wicked men those hellish principles reigning that would presently kindle and flame out into hellfire if it were not for God's restraints. There is laid out in the very nature of carnal man a foundation for the torments of hell. There are those corrupt principles in reigning power in them and in full possession of them that are seeds of hellfire. The principles are active and powerful, exceedingly violent in their nature, and if it were not for the restraining hand of God upon them, they would soon break out. They would soon flame out after the same manner as the same corruption, the same enmity does in the heart of damned souls that would beget the same torments as they do in them. The souls of the wicked are in scriptures or in the Bible compared to the troubled sea, as we read in the book of Isaiah chapter 57 verse 20. For the present, God restrains their wickedness by his mighty power as he does the raging waves of the troubled sea, saying, Here only shall you come, but no further. But if God should, with, would, should with, withdraw that restraining power, it would soon carry all before it. Sin is the ruin and misery of the soul. It is destructive in its nature. And if God should leave it without restraint, there would be nothing else to make the soul perfectly miserable. The corruption of the heart of man is immoderate and boundless in its fury. And while wicked men live here, it is like fire pent up by the course of nature. And as the heart is now a sink of sin, so if sin was not restrained, it would immediately turn the soul into a fiery oven or a furnace of fire and brimstone. Seventhly, it is no security to wicked men 
for, for one moment that there are no visible means of death at hand. It is no security to a natural man that he is now in hell and that he does not see the way he should now immediately go out of the world by an accident and that there is no visible danger in any respect in his circumstances. The manifold and continual experience of all the world in all the ages shows this is no evidence that a man is not on the very brink of eternity and that the next step will not be into another world. The unseen, unthought of ways and means of persons going out of the world are innumerable and inconceivable. Unconverted men walk over the pit of hell on a rotten covering, and there are innumerable places in this covering so weak that these places are not seen. The arrows of death fly unseen at noonday. The sharpest sight cannot discern them. God has so many different unsearchable ways of taking wicked men out of the world and sending them to hell that there is nothing to make it appear that God had need to be at the expense of a miracle or to go out of the ordinary course of his providence to destroy any wicked man at any moment. All the means that there are of sinners going out of the world are so in God's hands and so universally and absolutely subject to his power and determination that it does not depend at all the less on the mere will of God, whether sinners shall any moment go to hell than if means were never made use of or at all concerned in the case. Number eight, eighthly, natural men's prudence and care to preserve their own lives or the care of others to preserve them do not secure them for a moment. To this, divine providence and universal experience do bear testimony. There is this clear evidence that men's own wisdom is no security to them from death that if it were otherwise, we should see some difference between the wise and politic men of the world and others with regard to their liableness to early and unexpected death. But how is it, in fact? How dieth the wise man, as Ecclesiastes 2 verse 16? And the answer is, as the fool, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Ninthly, all wicked men's pains and contrivances which they use to escape hell while they continue to reject Christ and so remain wicked men do not secure them from hell one moment. Almost every natural man that hears of hell flatters himself that he shall escape it. He depends upon himself for his own security. He flatters in himself in what he has done, in what he is now doing, or what he intends to do. Everyone lays out matters in his own mind, how he shall avoid damnation, and flatters himself that he contrived well for himself and that his schemes will not fail. They hear indeed that there are but few saved and that the greater part of men that have died before are gone to hell. But each one imagines that he forms plans to effect his escape better than others have done. He does not intend to go to that place of torment. He says within himself that he intends to take effectual care and orders matters so for himself as not to fail. But the foolish children of men miserably delude themselves in their own schemes and in, in confidence in their own strength and wisdom. They trust to nothing but a shadow. 
the greater part of those who have lived before us under the same means of grace and are now dead are undoubtedly gone to hell or headed for hell. And it was not because they were not as wise as those that are now alive. It was not because they did not lay out matters as well for themselves to secure their own escape. If we could come to speak to them and inquire of them one by one whether they expected when alive and when they used to hear about hell ever to be subjects of that misery, we doubtless should hear one and another reply, No! I never intended to come here. I had arranged matters otherwise in my mind. I thought I should contrive well for myself. I thought my scheme good. I intended to take effectual care, but it came upon me unexpectedly. I did not look for it at the time, and in that matter it came as a thief. Death outwitted me. God's wrath was too quick for me. Oh, my cursed foolishness. I was flattering myself and pleasing myself with vain dreams of what I thought I would do hereafter. And when I was saying peace and safety, then sudden destruction came upon me. Tenthly, God has laid himself under no obligation by any promise to keep any natural man out of hell one moment. God certainly has made no promises either of eternal life or of any deliverance or preservation from eternal death. But what are contained in a covenant of grace, the promises that are given in Christ, in whom all the promise I, promises are yes and amen, but surely they have no interest in the promise of the covenant of, of grace who are not the children of the covenant who do not believe in any of the promises and have no interest in the mediator of the covenant. So that whatever some have imagined and pretended about promises made to natural men's earnest seeking and knocking, it is plain and manifest that whatever pains a natural man takes in religion, whatever prayers he makes till he believes in Christ, God is under no obligation to keep him a moment from eternal destruction. So that thus it is that natural men are held in the hand of God over the pit of hell. They have deserved the fiery pit and are already sentenced to it. And God is dreadfully provoked. His anger is great towards them. They have done nothing in the least to appease or abate their anger. Neither is God in the least bound by any promise to hold them up for one moment. The devil is waiting for them. Hell is gasping for them. The flames gather and flash about them and are ready to swallow them up. The fire pent up in their own hearts is struggling to break out. And they have no interest in the mediator. There are no means within reach that can be any security to them. In short, they have no refuge, nothing to take hold of. All that preserves them at any moment is the mere arbitrary will and uncovenanted, unobligated forbearance of an incensed God. Now let's apply this. The, uh, the use of this awful subject may be for awakening unconverted persons to a conviction of their danger. This that you have heard is the case of everyone out of Christ. That world of misery that lake of burning brimstone is extended under you. There is the dreadful pit of the glowing flames of the wrath of God. There is hell's wide gaping mouth open and you have nothing to stand upon, nor anything 
to take hold of. There is nothing between you and hell but the air. It is only the power and mere pleasure of God that holds you up. Now you are probably not aware of this. You may you find you are kept out of hell, but do not see the hand of God in it. But look at other things, at the good state of your bodily health, your care of your own life, and the means that you use for your own preservation. But indeed, these things are nothing. If God should withdraw his hand, they would avail no more to keep you from falling than the thin air to hold up a person who is suspended in it. Your wickedness makes you, as it were, heavy as lead, and to rend downwards with great weight and pressure towards hell. And if God should let you go, you would immediately sink and swiftly descend, and your healthy constitution and your own care and prudence and best contrivances and all your righteousness would have no more influence to uphold you and keep you out of hell that a spider's web would have to stop a falling rock. Were it not for the sovereign pleasure of God, the earth would bear, would not bear you one moment, for you're a burden to it. The creation groans with you. The creature is made subject to the bondage of your corruption. Not willingly, the sun does not willingly shine upon you to give you light and to serve sin and Satan. The earth does not willingly yield her increase to satisfy your lusts, nor is it willingly a stage for your wickedness to be acted upon. The air does not willingly serve you for breath to maintain the flame of life in your vitals while you spend your life in the service of God's enemies. God's creatures are good and were made for men to serve God with and do not willingly subserve any other purpose and groan when they are abused of purposes so directly contrary to their nature and end. And the world would spew you out were it not for the sovereign hand of him who has subjected it in hope. There are dark clouds of God's wrath now hanging directly over your heads, full of the dreadful storm and big with thunder. And were it not for the restraining hand of God, they would immediately burst forth upon you. The sovereign pleasure of God for the present stays his rough wind. Otherwise it would come with fury and destruction would come like a whirlwind and would be like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. The wrath of God is like great waters that are restrained for the present, but they increase more and more and rise higher and higher till an outlet is given. And the longer the stream is stopped, the more rapid and mighty its course when once it's let loose. It's true that judgment against your evil works has not been executed up to now. The floods of God's vengeance have been withheld, but your guilt in the meantime is constantly increasing and you are every day storing up more wrath and there is nothing but the mere pleasure of God that holds the waters back that are unwilling to be stopped and press hard to go forward. If God should only withdraw his hand from the floodgate, it would immediately fly open and the fiery floods of the, fear, of the fierceness and wrath of God would rush forth with inconceivable fury and would come upon you with omnipotent power and if your strength were 10,000 times greater than it is, yes, 10,000 times greater than the strength of the stoutest, sturdiest devil in hell, it would be nothing to withstand or endure it. The bow of God's wrath is bent and the arrow made ready on the string and justice directs the bow to your heart and strains at the bow 
and it is nothing but the mere pleasure of God and that of an angry God without any promise or obligation at all that keeps the arrow one moment from being drunk with your blood. Thus all, all you that never passed under a great change of heart by the mighty power of the Spirit of God upon your souls, all you that were never born again and made new creatures and raised from the dead in sin to a state of new are in the hands of an angry God. However you may have reformed your life in many things, and many have had religious affections and may keep up a form of religion in your families and closets and in the house of God, it is nothing but his mere pleasure that keeps you from this moment being swallowed up in everlasting destruction. However unconvinced you may now be of the truth of what you hear, by and by you will be fully convinced of it. Those that are gone from being in like circumstances with you see that it was so with them. For destruction came suddenly upon most of them when they expected nothing of it. And while they were saying peace and safety, now they see those things on which they depend for peace and safety were nothing but thin air and empty shadows. The God that holds you over the pit of hell, much in the same way as one holds a spider or some loathsome insect, over the fire abhors you and is dreadfully provoked his wrath toward you burns like fire he looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to be cast into the fire he is of purer eyes than to bear to have you in his sight you are ten thousand times more abominable in his sight than a most hateful venomous serpent is in yours. You have offended him infinitely more than ever a stubborn rebel did his prince, and yet it is nothing but his hand that holds you from falling into the fire every moment. It is to be ascribed to nothing else that you did not go to hell last night, that you were suffered to awake again in this world after you closed your eyes to sleep and there is no other reason to be given why you have not dropped into hell since you first arose in the morning but that God's hand has held you up. There is no other reason to be given why you have been listening to this video but his mercy. Yes, no other reason can be given you why you do not this very moment drop down into hell. O oh, sinner, consider the fearful danger that you are in. It is a great furnace of wrath, a wide and bottomless pit full of the fire of wrath that you are held over in the hand of that God whose wrath is provoked and incensed as much against you as against many of those that will be damned to hell. You hang by a slender thread with the flames of divine wrath flashing about it and ready every moment to singe it, to burn it asunder. And you have no interest in any mediator and nothing to lay hold of to save yourself, nothing to keep you off the flames of wrath, nothing of your own, nothing that you have done, nothing that you can do to induce God to spare, to spare you one moment. And consider here more particularly, firstly, whose wrath it is. It is the wrath of the infinite God. Now, if it were wrath only of man, though it were of the most potent prince, it would be comparatively little to be regarded. The wrath of kings is very much dreaded, especially of absolute monarchs who have the possession and lives of their subjects wholly in their power to be disposed of at their mere will. 
as we read in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 2, the fear of, of a king is as the roaring of a lion. Whoso provoketh him to anger sins against his own soul. So the subject who very much enrages an arbitrary prince is liable to suffer the most extreme torments that human art can invent or human power can inflict. But the greatest of earthly potentates in their greatest majesty and strength and when clothed in their greatest terrors are but feeble despicable worms of the dust in comparison with the great and almighty creator and king of heaven and earth. It is but little that they can do when most enraged and when they have exerted the utmost of their fury all the kings of the earth before God are as grasshoppers. They are nothing and less than nothing. Both their love and their hatred are to be despised. The wrath of the great king of kings is as much more terrible than theirs as his majesty is greater. As we read in Luke chapter 12 verses 4 and 5, And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him which after he has killed has the power to cast you into hell. Yes, I say, fear to him. <clears throat> so secondly, it is the fierceness of his wrath that you are exposed to. We often read of the fury of God as in Isaiah chapter 58 verse 18 where we read according to their deeds accordingly he will repay fury to his adversaries and in Isaiah chapter 66 verse 15 for behold the Lord will come with fire and with it, with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire and so also in many other places Thus we read, as in Revelation chapter 19, verse 15, the winepress of the, fierce, of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. The words are exceedingly terrible. If it, if it had only been said, the wrath of God, the words would have implied that which is unspeakably dreadful. But it is said the fierceness and wrath of God, the fury of God, the fierceness of Jehovah, of Yahweh, of God himself. Oh, how dreadful must that be? Who can utter or conceive what expressions carry in them? But it is also the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, as though there would be a very great manifestation of his almighty power in what the fierceness of his wrath should inflict as though omnipotence should be, as it were, enraged and exerted, as men are wont to exert their strength and fierceness, and in the fierceness of their wrath. Oh, then, what will be the consequence? What will become of the poor worm that shall suffer it, whose hands can be strong, and whose heart can endure? To what a dreadful, inexpressible, inconceivable, depth of misery must a poor creature be sunk who shall be the subject of this consider this that you that yet remain in an unregenerate state that god would execute the fierceness of his anger implies that he would infl inflict wrath without any pity when God beholds the ineffable extremity of your case and sees your torment to be so vastly disproportioned to your strength and see how your poor soul is crushed and sinks down, as it were, into an infin infinite gloom, he will have no compassion upon you. He will not forbear in the execution of his wrath 
or in the least lighten his hand, there shall be no moderation or mercy, nor will God then at all stay his rough wind. He will have no regard to your welfare, nor be at least careful, lest you should suffer too much in any other sense, than only that you shall not suffer beyond what strict justice requires. Nothing shall be withheld because it is so hard for you to bear. As we read in Ezekiel chapter 8 verse 18. Therefore will I also deal in fury. Mine eyes shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet I will not hear them. Now, God stands ready to pity you. This is the day of mercy. You may now cry with some encouragement of obtaining mercy. But once the day of mercy is past, your most lamentable and dolorous cries and shrieks will be in vain. You will be wholly lost and thrown away of God. As to any regard to your welfare, God will have no other use to put you to but to suffer misery. You may be continued in being to no other end. For you will be a vessel of wrath fitted to destruction. And there will be no other use of this vessel, but only to be filled full of wrath. God will be so far from pitying you when you cry to him, that is said, it is said he will only laugh and mock. As we read in Proverbs chapter 1 verses 24 to 32. Because I have called and you refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But you have set at naught all my counsel and would none of my reproof. I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear comes, when your fear comes as desolation and your destruction comes as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish comes upon you, then they shall call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge, and did not choose the fear of the Lord. That would they would have none of my counsel. They despised all my reproofs. Therefore, shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. How awful are those, are those words of the great God. I will tread them in mine anger and will trample them in my fury and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments and I will stain all my raiment, as we read in Isaiah chapter 63, verse 3. It is perhaps impossible to conceive of words that carry in them greater manifestations of these three things, namely contempt, hatred, and fierceness of in indignation. If you cry to God to pity you, he will be so far from pitying you in your doleful case, or showing you the least reward or of favour, that instead of that he will only tread you underfoot, and though he will know that you cannot bear the weight of omnipotence treading upon you, yet he will not regard that, but he will crush you under his feet without mercy. He will crush out your blood and make it fly, and it shall be sprinkled on the garment so as to stain all his clothes. He will not only hate you, but he will have you in the utmost contempt. No place shall be thought fit for you, but under his feet to be trodden down as the dirt of the streets. Thirdly, the misery that you are exposed to is that which God will inflict to the end that he might show what the wrath of Jehovah is, God has had it on his heart 
to show to angels and men both how excellent his love is and how terrible his wrath is. Sometimes earthly kings have a mind to show how terrible their wrath is by the extreme punishments they would execute on those that provoke them. For example, Nebuchadnezzar, that mighty and haughty monarch of the Chaldean Empire, was willing to show his wrath when, when enraged with Shadrach, Meshach and, and Abednego, and accordingly gave the order that the burning fiery furnace should be heated seven times hotter than it was. Doubtless it was raised to the utmost degree of fearness that human art could raise. But the great God is also willing to show his wrath and magnify his awful majesty and mighty power in the extreme suffering of his enemies. As we read in Romans chapter 9 verse 22. What if God, willing to show his wrath and make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction and seeing this is is his design and what he has determined even to show how terrible the unmixed unrestrained wrath the fury and fierceness of jehovah is he will do it there will be something accomplished and brought to pass that will be dreadfully witnessed when the great and angry God, great God, has risen up and executed his awful vengeance on the poor sinner and the wretch is actually suffering the infinite weight and power of his indignation, then will God call upon the whole universe to behold the awful majesty and the mighty power that is to be seen in it. As we read in the book of Isaiah, chapter 33, verses 12 to 14. And the people shall be as the burnings of lime. As thorns cut up, they shall be burned in the fire. Hear, you that are far off, what I have done. And you that are near, acknowledge my might. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnis, burnings? <clears throat> Thus it shall be with you that are in an unconverted state. If you continue in it, the infa infinite might and majesty and terribleness of the omnipotent God shall be magnified upon you in the ineffable strength of your torments. You shall be tormented in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And when you shall be in this state of suffering, the glorious inhabitants of heaven shall go forth and look on the awful spectacle that they may see what the wrath and fierceness of the Almighty is. And when they have seen it, they will fall down and adore the great power and majesty as we read in the book of Isaiah, chapter 66, verse 23 and 24. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, says the Lord. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of men that have transgressed against me, for their worms shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. Fourthly, it is everlasting wrath. It would be dreadful to suffer this fierceness and wrath of Almighty God for one moment, but you must suffer it to all eternity. There will be no end to this exquisite, horrible misery. When you look forward, you shall see a long forever, a boundless duration before you which will swallow up your thoughts and amaze your souls and you will absolutely despair of ever having any deliverances, any end, any mitigation, any rest at all. You will certainly know 
that you must wear out long ages, millions and millions of ages, in wrestling and conflicting with this almighty, merciless vengeance. And then, when you have done so, when many ages have actually been spent by you in this manner, you will know that all is but a point to what remains, so that your punishment will indeed be infinite. Oh, what can express what the state of such a soul is in such circumstances? All that we can possibly say about it gives but a very feeble, faint representation of it. It is inexpressible and inconceivable, for who knoweth the power of God's anger? How dreadful is the state of those who are daily and hourly in danger of this great wrath and infinite misery. But this is the dismissal, dismal case of every soul that has not been born again. However moral and strict, sober and religious, they may otherwise be. Oh, that you would consider it, whether you be young or old, male or female, there is reason to fear that there are many who will read, who will hear of this, that will um, see this video or have heard the gospel, who will actually be the subjects of this very misery to all eternity. I don't know who they are or what thoughts you may now be having. It may be now that you don't worry, you don't care about it and hear all these things without worrying without any disturbance to your mind and are now flattering yourselves that you are not the persons promising themselves yourselves that you shall escape. If I knew that there was one person and but one of those that we know that was to be the subject of this misery, wow. misery what an awful thing it would be to think of. If I knew who it was what an awful sight it would be to see such a person. Oh, how might every Christian might, up, might lift up a lamentable and bitter cry over him. But alas, instead of one, how many is it likely will remember these solemn reflections in hell? And some may be in hell a very short time before this year is out. And it would be no wonder if some of my viewers who are now in hell and quiet and secure may be there before tomorrow morning. Those of you who finally continue in a natural condition, who may keep out of hell the longest, will be there in a little time. Your damnation does not slumber. It will come swiftly and in all probability very suddenly upon many of you. You have reason to wonder that you are not already in hell. It is doubtless the case of some of you who have, who have seen and known that you never deserved hell more than you and that before this appeared as likely to have been now alive as you are now alive. Their case is past all hope. They will be crying in extreme misery and perfect despair. But here you are in the land of the living, blessed with the Bibles and the Sabbaths and ministers of the gospel and YouTube creators and have an opportunity to ob obtain salvation. What would not those poor, damned, hopeless souls give for one day's opportunity such as you now enjoy? And now you have an extraordinary opportunity, a day wherein Christ has thrown the door of mercy wide open and stands calling and crying with a loud voice to poor sinners, a day wherein many are flocking to him and pressing into the kingdom of God. Many are daily coming from the east, from the west, 
from the north and from the south, many that were very lately in the same miserable condition that you are in now, in a happy state with their hearts filled with love to him who has loved them and washed them from their sins in his own blood and rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God. How awful is it to be left behind at such a day and see so many others feasting while you are pining and perishing, to see so many rejoicing and singing for joy of heart while you have cause to, cause to mourn for sorrow of heart and to howl for vexation of spirit. How can you rest one moment in such a condition? Are not your soul as precious as the souls of those who are flocking from day to day to Christ? And are there not many who have lived long in the world who are not to this day born again? And so are aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and have nothing ever since they lived but treasured up wrath against the day of wrath. Oh, please, if that's your case, in a special, it's extremely dangerous. Your guilt and hardness of heart are extremely great. Do you not see how generally person, people of your years, are passed over and left in the dispensations of God's mercy? You need to consider yourselves and wake thoroughly out of your sleep. You cannot bear the fierceness, fierceness and wrath of the infinite God. And if you're a young person, a young man, a young woman, Will you neglect this precious season which you now enjoy when so many other age, other, others of your age are renouncing all youthful vanities and flocking to Christ? You especially now have an opportunity while you're young, but if you neglect it, it will soon be with you as it is with those persons who spent all the precious days of youth in sin and are now come to such a dreadful pass in blindness and hardness. What about you children who are unconverted? Do you not know that you're going down to hell to bear the dreadful wrath of that God who is now angry with you every day and every night? Will you be content to be the children of the devil when so many children are converted and are becoming the holy and happy children of the King of Kings. And let every one of you that is yet out of Christ and hanging over the pit of hell, whether you be old men, old women, middle-aged, young people, little children, listen to the loud cause of God's word and promise providence. This acceptable year of the Lord, a day of great mercy, to some will doubtless be a day as remarkable vengeance to others. Men's hearts harden and their guilt increases apace at such a day as this if they neglect their souls. Never was there a period when so many means were employed for the salvation of souls and if you entirely neglect them you will eternally curse the day of your birth. Now undoubtedly it is, as it was in the days of John the Baptist, the axe is laid at the root of the trees, and every tree which brings not forth good fruit may be hewn down and cast into the fire. Therefore let every one of you that is out of Christ now awaken and flee from the wrath to come, the wrath of Almighty God is now undoubtedly hanging over every unregenerate sinner. Let every one of you flee out of so Sodom. Escape for your lives. Look not behind you. Escape to the mountain, lest you be consumed. 